All right. Hi, guys. Everybody having a good show? Feet tired yet? Putting on sneakers? All right, so my name is Jordan Thiswood. I'm the senior product manager for Look Dev and Lighting. And uh, I want to talk with you about Katana 2.6 and 3 and all the goodness that's coming up. So how many people here uh, spend their time doing some manner of lighting in 3D? How many of you have problems with uh, interactivity, uh, loading files quickly? Yeah, OK. All right, so we'll, we'll get into more about that. Uh, but first, what I want to do is give you an idea of what kind of work uh, people are doing with Katana uh, so we can use that as the basis of our discussion. All right, so that was the Katana Reel. And here's a little cross-section of the type of companies that we have as using Katana. And so what's interesting is it's a mix of small, medium, and large-sized studios, cross-section of animation and visual effects. And each of them has you know, made use of the Katana power and feature set to basically answer their particular production problems. So anyone here really sort of doing sort of like TV episodic or high volume, high throughput? No? OK. Uh, how about high quality uh, visual effects? OK. So really more about asset complexity, photorealism, heavy, heavy, heavy. Yeah. And of course, we all have the same issue of everybody wants it better, faster, and cheaper. So all right. So the two parts that Katana covers, look development. So we don't get involved in modeling with Katana. It's really about. Somebody else has done the modeling. Someone else has done the animation. So we are the, re the recipient of the models from somebody else. Uh, but you then take the color choices, align that with the shaders and re lighting response. So you, in look development, are then handing off a Katana asset that is ready for shop production. The lighting side of it, at the core, comes down to this, the creative direction. So lighting really is about putting the right light in the right place with the right intensity, right color, and right quality. So hardness, softness, etc. And that is really what a lighting artist is there to do. Like if you like strip it all away, that's what you know the whole task is about. But unfortunately rendering has all this sort of complicated processes to it that are, you know, what are my sample levels? What am I, you know, splitting in the past is all these levers that you are pulling that still are the sort of workflow pieces around it. So Katana has been built to basically service the needs of getting back to this in the more and more complex scenarios. And it will be what we continue to drive it to be closer and closer to the art direction. OK, so a few things before we look at the software. Uh, loading heavy assets and heavy files quickly so you're not wasting time. Sharing assets and information between departments is key. Uh, sharing assets in within the lighting team is a big part of it. And then finally, uh, being able to do away with having to make RIP files for delayed read archives, .ISS, and VR scene files to basically have that deferred procedural workflow to actually fit things through RAM. So Katana actually fills the role of that whole workflow, so you don't need these anymore. And a few things to keep in mind. In Katana, everything is a reference. Okay? So unless you're actually adding primitives and things like that, there really isn't anything itself that is contributed in, term from, in terms of geometry. Obviously, lights come from Katana. Uh, the note graph functions as a template. There are ways that you use it uh, that allow for procedural and hierarchical operations. Nodes can be driven by rules. So you start combining all this together, and you start getting all the right pieces. 
which means that you can control whole sequences of shots. And with that comes this idea that you can have an artist layer of interaction. So who has ever submitted a shot to a farm that didn't quite have all the things turned on that you turned off to make it render faster? And then, yeah, you don't want to, no. Nah. Especially if it took all night to get there, that's never a good thing. All right. So back in the day when Katana first started, it was a much uh, more complicated program to get set up. Currently, there are rendering plugins from Solid Angle. Renderman team's got a you know, really nice one. The 3 Delight team have one that will be shipped with Katana 3. V-Ray Chaos Group and Redshift is working on theirs. So there's an ecosystem of rendering plugins, so you guys don't have to actually roll your own anymore. There's a set of tools like the USD uh, open source project, Multiverse, which also is compatible with the, the uh, USD. Golem putting a crowd system in. And then Deadline and Pipeline Effects for Cube support. So all these things that used to be the you know, hard to fit parts are now available from other parties. So if you want to figure out where things go, you work within Look Development. You're generating uh, the sort of data files that you can share. And it doesn't have to be through an asset management system, but always, you know, those are always better. You bring those into the lighting pipeline where you're bringing out all the geometry caches from everybody else. You do your magic here, and you fire it off the comb. OK, so before we get going, let's just take a look at this little scenario. Uh, it is a short film, or a little animated short from a Moto fan that they've kindly provided to us by a gentleman by the name of Brian Vowles. If I can hit the right button. There was a, a Moto user who finds our antics to be somewhat disconcerting. Oh, really? Yes. They, so I think in the interest of saving our show, David, we need to, we need to bring it down. <coughs> and so, and this week on Modcast, we'll be talking now. about... 701 sneak peeks. Yes. Let us discuss recently the Moto 701 sneak videos that we've been posting on our YouTube playlist. David, I gotta tell you. And in direct contact. I am very excited about mm. the videos we've been posting. I think the videos elaborate on our ideals as a company and what we like to project to our user base. Yes, I hope I can and convey my excitement mm, to the community about these videos. Whoa, whoa, Brad. Tone it. I need to bring it, it down. down. I just, apologize. Just, I, was, so, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> it's really, it's like, you cannot cage the beast. No. All right, so 21 shots. And... When you guys work on multiple projects, have you ever worked in a hierarchy like this? So you basically start grouping shots together based on common work that needs to be required. So this is a great way, if you already have this philosophy sort of uh, in your mindset when you're working through your, your shots, what you can do in Katana is that you can actually, within one project file, start at, you know, with one shot where you establish the full art direction, all the technical setups, and then you can split that off into the <laughs> subordinate shots that then have you know, their children shots from it. People use this key shot, master shot, sub shot, parent, child. There's many different ways that people refer to it. But the idea is that as you flow through this graph, you get the shots where really an artist shouldn't have to touch it. You know, if you had the right tool sets, you wouldn't actually have to do much to it with the one caveat that if, if uh, the upstream department has actually done their job and not cheated, so that the information is consistent, then you'll be able to get through it all. OK. So the end result of that is if you actually can work that way, then you can have one master shot feeding a number of uh, key shots, which then result in a big efficiency because you're not processing by hand all those masses of shots that have no unique value to the lighting artist or uni no unique requirement of the lighting artist. You know, that's the thing is that you know, the human brain, vision, emotions, those are the things that you need to bring to the table as a lighting artist. But if all the technical complexity can be handled by the computer, why contribute to those shots if, you know, you can move on to more valuable, you know, contributions, okay? All right, if we can switch over to the Linux workstation, guys. Thank you. All right, so what we've got here is our little uh, scene. And we've got this rendered off by 3 Delight. And what we'll do is we'll just take a little quick tour around. So we've got the node graph here, which is at the heart of it. We've got the, the monitor 
for what we receive the renders from, the 3D viewport. The bottom left-hand side is what we call the scene graph. So Maya Outliner, however you want to think about it, is just your hierarchical view of your 3D scene. Now, important thing for you to remember is that the 3D scene inside of Katana is whatever node you're looking at, OK? So right now, we've got a bunch of lights up there, so the little yellow lines. If I step back and say, I actually want to view the 3D scene as it's made there, they all go away. So you got to figure out that Katana works in a way where it's like 3D scene compositing. So you're taking different parts of geometries, you're merging them together to create a new th you know, set of 3D data. You're t making color corrections in the form of applying shaders or changing attributes, setting visibilities, things like that. So if you sort of are strong in sort of comp and nuke in that workflow, you can apply that same paradigm to this. So it's just a, the same idea that it's a consecutive set of steps that work your way through the process that gets you to the end result that you then hand off to the rendering engine. And the beautiful thing is that because you then have everything driven by rules, or you can have it driven by rules, that consecutive set of steps becomes a repeatable process, and that's how you can kind of get through a lot. Okay? So we've got 21 shots, and let's start to take a look at what's the end game here. How do I work with multiple shots faster and get through this art direction? So what we have in Katana, the artist interacts with uh, the lighting in two modes. You can either do the traditional preview rendering, where you basically wait for the full finished frame, you make a change, you do another render. Uh, but we also have live rendering. And so what we have going on here is we've got the full 3D scene. All updating. And we have this thing called the graph state variable. So remember I said we had this hierarchy of shots that we could go through. So in Katana, what I've done is I've set up this project file so it has all 21 shots being read into it. And I can literally toggle between shots. And so as a lighting artist or a lighting lead, I don't have to actually sit there and kind of push something off to the farm to get a whole bunch of results back. I'm actually getting access to every single shot. I can make one change and see it across all of them and then kind of make a very uh, informed decision about what I'm doing. Because I mean, it's one of those processes where this is pretty easy. They're all kind of standing in the, well, sitting in the same spot. But if you had a, you know, sort of a, one of those scenes where it's walking and talking, you, or you got like multiple effects where, you know, it's a car flipping down the road, you might work out that the key light angle is good in one shot. Then you go to the next three, and you're like, ah, I chose the wrong shot to get started with. And so then you adjust it for the three. Then you go back to the first one, and it's all wonky. Working this way means that you can actually just toggle your way through. But then how do you deal with it when you actually have decided that, OK, I've surveyed through enough. I know the choices I want to make. And the answer is you start using the graph state variables. So those are uh, basically any key value pair. So we've set this one up to use shot, but it could be time of day. It could be high res, low res. It can be whatever you want. And so what I can do is I can put in another one of our lighting tools, which is called a gaffer 3. And what I can do is I can wire it up here, like so. And what I can do is I can put in what we call a variable switch node, which we'll look at in a bit more detail. And now I can wire it up in here. So it's kind of everything is in the name. It's expecting one of these graph state variables. So I can say, hey, I want you to listen to shot. And then on the second input, I want you to use let's say, shot 80. Now, what I can actually do is say, great, this looks cool. But what I want to do is start making some changes. All the lights are here in the gaffer. So it's basically a lighting control panel in a node. You can add, edit, uh, change colors, assign the, you know, the type of lights. Fairly straightforward. You say add. You can pick from the, the lights that you want. There's a lot of cool ones with your light. We'll cover those in a minute. So right now, what I want to do is actually say, OK, how do I then make a change here uh, for uh, the scene? So what I can do is I can come to this one and say, hey, I want to look at the incoming scene lights. So it is yet to make its own one. But what I can do is I can view all the scene, the lights that are somewhere else from the node graph at this point. 
I can then pick one. So let's say that I want this one here. I can adopt it for editing. And then I can adjust, let's say, its color just to keep it really obvious. Okay. So there we go. Now what happens is that if I then go back to any other shot, so let's just go nearest neighbor at 70. You'll see that you don't get that change. So what's really cool, though, is that it's a not a blocking uh, change in that we're actually just capturing the one thing we changed. So everything else stays the same. So if I then say, OK, well, based on this camera angle, what I want to be able to do is say that, yeah, you know what, let's make it a little bit brighter. I can do that. And that is now going to ripple through every single shot because it's, I made it on the version here where all the lighting is coming from. And so I branch out here for shot 80. Everything else is going through for the sequence there. And so you can see that you can start to like put together, chain together these nodes in that sort of same hierarchy fashion. Right, so that that will end up giving us our whole hierarchy, or giving you the, the sequence-based lighting. And then when you're all done, what you can do is say, I want to group this. And we actually have a mechanism called the live group. And so what we can do with a live group is basically say, OK, we want to take that node. And it could be 100 nodes, it could be 1,000 nodes, or it could just be the one node. We want to write it out to a disk and then be able to use it somewhere else. So I can say that I want to publish and finish editing contents. I can say that I want to call it My Lights, save it out. And there we go. It'll be on disk if I then bring in a live group. And I edit that. Then there's My Lights. So you can imagine you're able to share and you can access this all the various lights. You can take any objects, any part of the node graph, share it this way. So it just becomes one of that ways where you can share a bunch of the objects around. Now that we've kind of gotten over those principles, let's take in a deeper look at alternate ways in uh, Katana that you can get some extra firepower using the 3 to light plugin. So what these guys have done uh, is taken the power of Katana, examined it, and gone, OK, how do we apply a nice ease of use over it? You know, Katana has this reputation of being this super powerful, but a bit obtuse, hard to grasp, hard to, to run program. So these guys have done a really great job of simplifying that process out. So when you look at the render globals, it's really, really elegant. So you have one shading samples control. So this is now based on, it used to be, a, 3 d Light was a raised-based architecture before, based on the RI spec. It's been rewritten from the ground up to be nodal scene interface. So it's now brand new architecture, which the, no the way to describe the nodal scene interface is it's essentially a direct match for the way that the scene graph is constructed and shares attributes. So it works very well in tandem with Katana. So things like the shading samples being a single control uh, sort of plays on that idea of that direct match and simplicity. Okay? So if you've only got one control to pull, it makes working a lot easier. Shading samples are decoupled. Adding the, uh, the AOVs in Katana is really simple. You just click on the ones you want, hit OK, you add them in, you're done. But then it goes even a few steps farther. So if I actually come across here and say I want to refresh my list of lights, I can show you one very fun way of working. So you've got a bunch of lights in your scene. Uh, you want to actually get to the point where you have your final render. So live rendering is awesome when you're trying to really rough in a lot of things. But because of the way that live rendering in all programs kind of has this sort of uh, refinement process, it's not you know, maybe the best choice when it comes to actually fine tuning down to the like, nth level uh, all the details. So what this is doing is rendering out uh, behind the scenes in the 3D light display every single light AOV from that one uh, button click process. And so what I have here is the list of all the lights. But then when it gets through it, we have a very interesting implication. 
So why are they all there? Well, if I turn on the light mixing mode, it gets pretty simple. I can start to fine tune all the contributions of all the lights. All right, some other interesting trivia. Uh, apart from about four or five light sources, a lot of this is actually lit by incandescent geometries. And what's cool is that you saw we're working with really low sample levels, and you're actually getting geometries as mesh lights that are actually then uh, illuminating the scene. And the, the difference is that they actually have um, MIS sampling across those geometry light sources, and then a specialized workflow with the Gaffer 3. So things like being able to take whole groups of assets, treat them like a light source. Uh, you can either use them as you know, discrete light sources, OK, or you can um, then also say, all right, I've got a whole bunch of incandescent textures on these assets. Say you've got magic mushrooms that are glowing in the forest, and then you want to be able to control them. Traditionally, you would actually use those with, um, you would go and adjust them shader by shader. Well, what you can do is you can assign that whole group to then have uh, be controlled by a tool in the Gaffer 3. So let's take a look at that part. But very quickly while we're at it. So you can see, driving back to the Gaffer, if I re render this, it's going to come out and be the same. Once I drastically improved it, but it shows that it works. OK. So let's go take a look at a different shot. So when it comes to the geometric based lighting, <laughs> a little preview there. So we've got two elements that come into play here. One is that scenario I said where you've got assets in your scene that you want to create as an incandescent object. So they're in place. You don't need to move them around. What you need to do is actually get a legitimate uh, contribution of their illumination to the scene. So there's that aspect. And then there's the aspect where you need, for the sake of, say, the reflection, uh, that you want to have a particular light shape. So the whole world of ray tracing has opened up all these possibilities. That's actually really cool. All right, so these signs over here are all actually being driven by a mesh light. So in this case, uh, we have the iHeart and Moto on this side. And it's just really pulling a set of shapes. Or in the case of Moto, it is actually just pulling a group node with all those pieces and below it, OK? So this is nice. You can actually start grouping things together. Uh, cell is something that I'll show you in a second. The future updates on this will actually use an expression so that you don't actually have to have all the geometries that you want to control their incandescence with under one unique object. You'll actually be able to say, just find me all the you know, star, light bulb, star, and it would take all the light bulbs in the whole scene and then become a master control for them, which is pretty cool. All right. So all these work in the same way. There we go. All right, so the nice thing is that these all get treated like legitimate light sources. So instead of being pieces of geometry, when you view them as a light source, all the tools that are within uh, the Gaffer 3 start working that way. So it means that if you then want to override these on a shot later on, that same workflow applies, which is pretty cool. And then if we look at another shot, I do believe shot 60. There we go. 
sec. There we go. There we go. All right. So we got this nice little bookend at the back. And just as a nod to the creator of Katana, because he loves tacos, I actually made a taco light. There we go. So what that actually is, literally is a taco. And so it's that idea that you can actually then find inside the scene. If I come in and actually say I want to find the taco light, there we go. So that becomes an emissive object that's treated like a complete light source. And not quite sure what the virtues of the taco shape really bring to it, but it was certainly fun. But it just gives you the idea that if you have, let's say, like a photo softbox that you need to recreate, if you have a, a you know, particular light source, but you need the independent control for placement, intensity, color, but the shape is what's really important, you can work with that way. And again, you're turning a light source or a piece of geometry into a legitimate light source that we can then say, turn it off, or just give me that one control, or put it into the whole sequence based workflow. And with that, I think I should probably let Barry get on here, and I will be introducing Barry in just a minute when he gets set up. So guys, if you're interested in Katana, please stick around, because the next presenter is absolutely fantastic. Oh, I've been told that you should look into your seats, because there's some t-shirts. Everybody else owes.